if I known Tony was going to be here, I would have had some more memes, <laughs> any memes. I, uh, I was channeling Tony to like knit this right before the, <laughs> the deadline. So uh, <laughs> that can be meme, particularly but, uh, dangerous. Yeah. With these chapters. Tony's legacy is a hundred percent memes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Memes about knitting. Uh, yeah, so I didn't see these objectives until today, but I think I got them all covered. So we're on the same page. Uh, it's really focusing on on two packages. They mentioned Lime here as another R package for model explanation. And I wonder if, if one of these other packages has a dependency on that because I didn't see any specific Lime function. So if anybody knows about that, Feel free to chime in, but I think Lime just maybe is a dependency on, on one of these because mostly what I use is Dalex and Dalextra. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'll be interested to see how it goes because I, I they mentioned Lime and um, and VIP, which I think they touch on VIP, but everything's Dalextra really in this whole chapter. So and it's it's good. I it's it's going to be a lot of this is another Dalextra function, another Dalextra function, but um yeah i'll just i'll get right into it. it what i really loved is oh i'll I'll do the i i tan and i've been working on a, a expected rushing yards model in the nfl and so i just kind of poured it over it's a cat boost model and basically i just i brought that that model in I, i'm happy to share the code it's up in my github but we've been training models and tuning parameters for a long time so we're starting with a model i've got some nfl data almost uh, a hundred thousand rush attempts from 2016 through 2020. And I've got maybe 35 to 40 variables, uh, you know, home team, when the game was played, where the run was, left, right, middle, there's, there's different gaps in football, like between the guards, between the tackles, off the end. Um, some things about the stadium, you know, whether it was played on grass or turf, is it open, uh, an open stadium or a, a roof, a dome? Um, I've got the player's position, things like season, and then when the game was played, uh, there's, I know there's wind and weather in here, and then there are all kinds of things about the specific run itself. Did it come when the quarterback was uh, in a shotgun formation? Was there a no huddle, the snap before? If it's a quarterback run, was it a drop back or a scramble, sorry, a scramble or like a designed run? Um, yeah. Uh, this is all from the NFL Fast R package, which has made play-by-play -play data available back to 1999, I think. So it's really cool data source. If you're watching this and you haven't uh, heard of NFL Faster, definitely go check it out. Um, that's kind of just a little bit about the background of, of what the data we're playing with. If anybody has any questions, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, I can uh, I can get into the Dalek stuff. Because, okay. So... Dalex has all these explain functions, so you can use this for lots of different types of machine learning algorithms. And then Dale Extra is one in particular uh, where you can do tidy models. And so it's got the special function. They had verbose set to false in the book, and I think it's, it's actually pretty cool here what comes out of the verbose equals true. So basically, you feed in your model, the, the data frame. I, I've already... I, I did the, the um, test and training sets, the cross-validation when I was training the model. So I just fit the full data set back in here just, just to kind of show you what's going on. Uh, and yeah, some of these um, outputs here are actually kind of interesting because it tells you of the predicted value, what is your min, mean, and max. So it's saying that the average rush prediction here is 4.4 yards, which I think is exactly what an average rush is in the NFL. It predicts down to a, a negative two yard loss, which which happens quite a bit. You can have usually losses from one to five yards, and then a maximum rush here of sixty seven yards. Obviously, the maximum rush on an NFL field is is ninety nine yards, so it, it's not predicting anything. That's a ninety nine yard rush. You'll find with a lot of the open source football data, that's hard to predict um, rushing yards. So there was a pretty cool competition with the big data bowl a few years ago. Um, Tony was in it this year. A few years ago, they did. Uh, expected rushing yards and they have the, the player tracking data and you can do a really cool rush yards model but uh, and then the residuals here i thought was pretty cool you can see just how off uh, some of them were 
And yeah, so I like to leave that verbose set to true. And here's a cool plot that is not in the main book, but it is in one of the references. So they reference this book called Ex Explanatory Model Analysis. And oh, I'll use that a lot. The the uh, this chart is actually on the Dalex GitHub page. If you want to find it again, but I think this is a really good summary of of all these different functions because they talk about two things. They've got instance level and data set level. So data set level would be what are kind of some summary stats on the model as a whole. How do how does um, how does you know this trend of a of a variable change? You're looking at all the data in the data set on the right side of the pyramid here. And on the left side, we have instance level. So now you're interested, you're zooming in on one particular prediction you want to understand. So like if you have a business partner that says, why is our model outputting this? You know, we don't understand. We would expect to be closer to this. This left side of the, the pyramid here is how you zoom in on an instance level observation. And so that kind of breaks it down into these different levels. We're going to hit on these middle four here. So kind of diagnostics um, and model performance are kind of covered in tidy models, but these middle four are definitely a, a gap where uh, there's there's room for this Dalex package to um, to shine. There's the uh, abbreviation. I, I, I've seen a lot of, <laughs> uh, I forget the word, not acronym, but uh, acrostic maybe. Um, that are, are kind of convoluted. So I didn't, I didn't know idea what Dalex did for until I, I saw this, they're using the D uh, in model to make this work. But we're gonna hit all four of these parts of the, the pyramid. So starting with predict parts, I think is, is what they call a local explanation. Um, this provides information about a single observation and, and asks what variable contributes to this result the most. Uh, they call these breakdowns and they compute the contribution from each feature. Um, it's pretty cool because you get information on a lot of different features all at once, but uh, each one of these is an additive uh, value. So it's not great for, for interactions or, or variables that have high correlations. And so we can see here that the, the intercept here is 4.4 yards. And I, I tried to knit a PNG, it kind of got shrunk. So 4.4 uh, here. Um, I, I realized while I was doing this, which is why it's a good reason to, to uh, model evaluation, this drive play, drive play count, drive play count variable is actually um, some data leakage. So this is not what play of the drive it's on, it's how many total plays the drive had. And so knowing that the drive only went three plays probably means that you didn't do very well in this rush. So this is actually data leakage here and that's why it's turning out to be the most important variable. I'm actually retraining the model right now to, to take this out, but it's, it's, it's still running in the background. And so I guess what this says is if you know the drive is only three plays long, well, that's kind of a failure. If you're running on, on third down, it, it's a hard time to run the ball and it, it takes already a yard off of your, your predicted rush. So we started with a 4.4 yard rush and just knowing this alone with this additive feature takes a yard off. And it kind of does this for each of the factors here. Um, expected points at, at half a point means that this is uh, this is expected points in, in NFL terms. So your, your football team at the, 66 yard line or your own uh, for own 34, it, you're pretty unlikely to score. You're only expected to score half a point. And so this again uh, is, is hurting the rushing model. A lot of these are pretty small contributions and you end up with a, with a prediction down here that's, that's 2.0 something. And so I, what I get out of this is it's a pretty hard down to run on here. Um, second down, 10 yards, it's 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 one of the, actually the worst downs to run in football. So the kind of this this makes sense to me intuitively why the prediction is so much lower than than the average NFL rush. Um, any questions on, on kind of what the breakdown plot is going to look like? Because we're going to have a few of these. So like I said one of the one of the cons of the breakdown plot is that it, it, it's misleading for models with interactions. And this is a cat boost model. And so it doesn't have interactions exactly. It might have interactions, right? Whereas it splits the different nodes. So like, uh, let's say 
it's not so bad to run in shotgun, but maybe it is pretty bad to run in shotgun on second down. Um, what you can do is, is there a breakdown pops with interaction is this takes much longer. I, I, not quite um, this, oh no, this is the wrong plot. This is the right plot. My plot's got switched. So this is the breakdown plot for the interactions. It, it basically iterates over all of the interactions. And so that's why it's so time consuming, but there's not really any formal statistics statistical significance tests. So uh, kind of take with a grain of salt still. Um, right here, you, you're somewhat subject to, to the random um, sampling variance. And so the one interaction term that it picked out here was uh, the fixed drive, which is the, the, the 20th drive of the football game. And with the game seconds remaining would be 132. So that's less than two minutes is, is the only interaction here that it picked out. And so either the, the forest model isn't using very many interactions and it's not very important, or just uh, this random sampling didn't, didn't pick them out very much. And so one thing that, that I think is really important to think about with these breakdown models is, is uh, what's happening with your interactions. But we can kind of see a prediction here that's a little bit better than the average 4.4 yard rush. It's, it's third down, a quarterback rush definitely helps. It adds almost a half a yard of expectation. Um, I guess with yards to go here, at two, it's telling you, so we got a third and two. That's a pretty typical rushing down in the NFL. And so the defense might sell out to stop the run, um, especially uh, around the middle. So this is, this is to the middle guard. So this is where a lot of the, the bigger defensive linemen play. That's what, you know, these three factors are making it a harder rush. And you can kind of see um, why the breakdowns struggle with, highly correlated features. So this one is actually just a linear combination of these two, but I left it in the, in the tree boost model because I thought that sometimes it, you know, it might pick up on whether, you know, if it's just a guard run, maybe that's what's significant. Maybe it's uh, left guard or right guard. Middle guard, I think is, is a QB sneak. It's, it's almost a, a very rare combination to be middle guard. I think I, I might've manufactured that uh, the data because it just like it said it was running to the guard, but it had missing whether it was left or right. Uh, so yeah, we actually ended up with a prediction that's a little bit better than, than the NFL average here. And, and we can see that we've got an, an interaction term. Uh, I wanted to, so this plot is actually the, the Shapley plot, Shapley plot, Shapley plot. Um, so I'll, I'll zoom it here so we can look at both. I thought this is pretty cool because I've heard Shapley values a lot and I didn't really know what they meant until I was again reading this explan explanatory model analysis book. They have a whole section on it. And it actually comes from from game theory. So it's it's kind of a game where the the players are trying to uh get like the most out of uh a game and cooperation is is the most beneficial strategy because it uh benefits the group as a whole. Like I think of like the prisoner's dilemma for example. And so uh, using that methodology, you get kind of a, a plot for uh, working together. What is the most collective gain on a few of these variables? And so this is kind of another way to look at it. They've got nice little block plots to show you, that, you know, whether or not this contribution is, is statistically significant from zero. And I should add at this point that a lot of this chapter um, is just coming up with some cool custom plots. So with the, the Dalex package, you, you get a lot of these data sets, but you can you can definitely go and, and make your own plots a lot prettier than, than the one that I just showed you here. So this is actually the same kind of Shapley distribution plot, but you can see that they've got uh, some nicer boxes and stuff. So definitely go check that out if you don't like the way they look. Yeah, that's a good example too, John. Rose in a boat. I'm sure Tan, Tan can relate to this too. I, I don't think the default is Shapley, but that's a good question. So I, I ended up reading one chapter in the tidy models of our book and like six chapters over here in this book. So that's why I'm, I'm gonna jump over here to to look at what the, the default is for these breakdown plots. I, this is the default one, the one that we had the first time. And 
yeah, it's type equals breakdown, I think is the is the default value. I know that they, they wrote it out here explicitly, but um, yeah, so this is the, the default Shapley plot. And, and so I think this is interesting because you can kind of see things like this variable while it is decreasing the, you know, it, having this many seconds left in the game is not an ideal time to run. Having this, this uh, box and whisker plot shows you that it's maybe not significant from zero. And so if you wanted to maybe parse your, you know, parse down your variables later, this, this one might not be uh, contributing to your model. Uh, running back in particular here is one that is significant. And so running back rushes are actually gonna have a much lower expectation than wide receiver or quarterback rushes because one quarterbacks and wide receivers often run on the outside of the formation on the ends and they're faster so they can reach the, the edge and get downfield and running backs do a lot of time running in between the tackles, guards where there are lots of defenders that they run into. Um, yeah, again, one of the, the cons here is that if it's not additive, these, these values can be misleading. Uh, so those are definitely three different types of, of uh, oh, I got the code down here below. Um, three different types that you can add. So this was, this is breakdown. The default was breakdown, a uh, breakdown interaction. We saw the second one and then Shapley values at the bottom. I think there are some more. Tony asked about oscillation and I'm not hundred percent sure what that does. So we'd have to check the, the docs, but does anybody have any question on, you know, kind of what a local explanation. Something I, I thought was interesting throughout this chapter yeah. is they talk about how, you know, there isn't anything within tidy models for this. We just are referencing these other packages. And then within the chapter, they write a whole bunch of functions in order to use those other packages. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, maybe maybe those functions could be in a different package. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting that you know they make the and maybe it is just to make nice visualizations, but the nice visual visualizations are nice. Yeah. So um, you know if you're watching this, uh, <laughs> I do think it could be helpful to have a package that is just about like using. The visualizations are using the the explanations. Is this like a flip the coin? Who takes the spinoff package for this? Or <laughs> well, that's the other thing is they have a bunch of other things that are already yeah. on their to do list. But they they wrote the functions already. Just put them yeah, in a package. Did. Did. <laughs> um, I would like to see kind of what's inside these breakdowns. I actually didn't look myself. I shouldn't click on them because I don't want to crash my. I'm getting better at glimpse. Um, I, I do have a question. Maybe I'll get to this in a second. Um, if you're going to do cover more of the, yeah. the global attributions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious like how it handles, how it aggregates uh, categorical variables. Uh, you know, especially when you're not dumbing them out like you are with, like you aren't with cat boost. Like how does it aggregate the uh, like for you know for an individual observation right you're gonna like say it's like i don't know say you had down as like a categorical variable so you had three right and then like maybe there's a value for that for a given observation and then maybe for another play it's like it's one right and like you have a value for that maybe it's like negative and versus being positive for another observation i'm just curious how like whenever you do like the global attribution and just like what's the overall impact of down how it like <laughs> how it averages I guess over those things uh, I mean I guess you know with like always with an instance level um, you know given a certain feature um, the, the, maybe it's, you're using Shapley here uh, maybe the Shap value is different even given the same feature value just because all the other like features are different um, and you can average that over across across like all observations but for like a categorical variable you know whenever you're I guess summing up to the global level and just Curious, like what the process is for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think I'm gonna get into the global a little bit more. And then I also had some trouble with the categorical variables, especially, I can't remember which one it was, like the ceteris paribus, I think. I tried to use a categorical variable and it, it, it spit it back out at me. And yeah. so I, don't have the answer to your question off the top of my head, but I think we can play with it a little bit later. 
Yeah, no, it, it's like an interesting, like, I don't know the answer myself necessarily. <laughs> I just like know, like, you know, there's like pros and cons, or, like a, maybe like dummying out a categorical variable. Like you do, maybe it's like clear, right? If it's always zero or one, and then you get like a Shapley value in the end, it just be like you're averaging across all observations. I guess you'll get, you get non-zero Shapley values for each of those categories. And it's like, how do you, how do you reach, how do you reason about that? Uh, you know, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, I think I have one more here for the the local explanation. And so this is the ceteris paribus profile. So back on our our plot here, we, right, we saw predict parts. And this is predict profile. Um, I like this because it, so it shows how the prediction would change if if only this this value changed. And so this is a, a nice um, graphical representation. Again, I think this is true with a lot of these. If, if you have highly correlated or interaction variables, then then uh, these might not be 100% accurate. So I, I am looking at uh, Russia age here. And so this is our, our, our prediction. I, I picked different um, random points for all these. So, so don't think that we're still tracking the same rush from earlier. <laughs> but this is kind of interesting. I, I, I would expect this to be monotonic. You know, if there is some relation between rush or age and, and how far uh, someone's expected to rush the ball or expected to be declining throughout all of it. So there's probably some kind of bias in here, or I could go and force this to be monotonic in, in the model. But, uh, you know, when we're talking about positions, this might be somewhere where we've also got a lot of, of selection bias, right? So mobile quarterbacks, if this was a quarterback run, if it's, if it's predicting up here at like six yards, I, for, I'm usually thinking it's, it's a quarterback rush or something on the edge. Um, mobile quarterbacks don't usually rush into their, you know, their forties. Um, and so, you know, there could be a, a jump here because we've seen a lot more mobile quarterbacks come into the league lately and, and they're rushing more. Maybe this is like the peak age for, for running backs when they get, you know, higher workload, there are all kinds of different things that would that cause this not to be monotonic, but rusher age can definitely be correlated with, with other things like position. And then here we've got the prediction for um, the yard line. And so we see this decre decreasing as we get closer to the end zone. You know, kind of the football explanation would be that one, it's, it's, it's harder to rush as you get closer to the end zone because you're down on the, the two yard line. The defense is all packed into two yards. They don't want you to rush in for a touchdown, so that they might sell out to stop the rush in that scenario. Whereas, if you're back here on the you know in the seventy or the eighty, you've got lots of room to rush, or they might be focused on on stopping the pass instead of the rush at that point because um, a rush from this area might not hurt you as much as the pass. You could also only rush for like two yards if you're on the two yard line. Yeah, exactly. So it's like feeds into it. Yeah. Tony makes a good point. This is kind of the the instance level PDP plot, and I think this is pretty cool because you know sometimes I get questions at, at my job where it's like the model has made this prediction, but what would it be like if X? You know, what would it be like? If, so I'm working on a on a baseball model, so it was like, what would what would this be like if we had a better starting pitcher? Or you know, the model fed in X. We we think the pitcher is is X good, but really. He's been on a hot streak, so someone's asking, you know, why, what it would be like if, if we if we had a better value for them instead. And so I think this is a good way to answer that question of, okay, well, what if we had someone rushing the ball who was instead 25 years old? What, how would that change the prediction? You can kind of have a plot like this to show them. Um, is this uh, assume like the other variables are held constant? Yeah, Does it exactly. tell you what those are in the the object or no? Um, so like the object that creates the right. So you feed it like a singular prediction, right? Yeah. Like slice your data frame. You know, it's age is twenty five. Blah 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 blah. And then you can just control pressure age. Does it have? Um, well, I suppose you could just know what you're inserting into it. That's kind of a stupid question. Never mind. Yeah, so can you guys see my, my R instance? I can't remember if I presented this. Uh, no, we just see your um, oh. Internet Explorer. If I can swap that over. New share. So this is 
I think this is kind of what you're asking. I, I put a glimpse on the uh, the Paribus object that we were just talking about. And it looks like what it does is just recreates your data for, or it holds season constant. So this is the same throughout all. And then it's just going to change the the variable of interest or I'm not sure if it has it here. Rush or age would be. It must have the variable. Oh, okay. So I did two things. I got rush or age and I've got yard line. So I'm sure they're both here in this variable name. And uh, yeah, I don't know what IDs are. I'm sure that, that it changes these variables basically through every constant combination of, of the other variables. Um, so that is the second instance level plot here. And then we're going to go over to the data set level plots. We've got global explanation. So this one is kind of similar to the, the VIP package, which did not work for my particular cat boost model, but this is pretty much the same thing. Again, the they made great functions with much um, better looking uh, variable importance plots. And I like this dotted line for kind of what the, the uh, RMSE in, the, in their instance was uh, with the variable, without the variable. This is kind of the same thing here with, with these, but it's just not um, quite as, as interesting to look at. I, I talked about earlier how drive play count was data leakage. So that comes in as the most important feature. That's why it's, it's definitely good to, <laughs> you want to catch it beforehand, but if you don't, the second best time to catch it is, is here on the, <laughs> the feature importance plots. So then the second one here is a, the yard line 100. Like Jordan said, you can only gain two yards if you're on the two yard line. So um, without the necessary like player tracking data, when you've got the public open source stuff, this is kind of as good as it gets. You know, EP also takes a lot of these things into account. So you know, the expected points for the football field are going to be highly dependent on down uh, yards to the sticks and the yard line, how close you are to the end zone. So this is kind of a, uh, I don't want to say a PCA, but it, it's kind of like a, a feature that also contains lots of these. So I'm not surprised that it comes in pretty high in this model. Uh, most of these are not really changing the root mean square error. So I think with like 40 variables and stuff, not one in particular is, is super important. A lot of these, um, time remaining ones are, are highly correlated. And so I could play with a correlation field feature. I know that variable important plots, um, yes, I actually wrote a note, ex expected to spread the importance across many variables. So, you know, if I'd only pick one of these, I would, I would assume that game seconds remaining is probably the most important of the three. Uh, it, it's probably pretty easy to run if you're, you're down a lot and you're supposed to be throwing and it's, it's also a little, harder to rush if you're winning and you're trying to burn clock. So game seconds is probably the most important of the three, but none of them show up as very important because they're, they're kind of stealing each other's contributions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. I don't think VIP supports cat boost, but this is pretty much the same thing. I think this is almost as good. Uh, so this was, oh, this is a code that runs it, but uh, again, dependent on the random nature of the, of the, of the permutations. I, I think that there's a way on one of these to control how many permutations you do. And I'm sure as with all things, if you do more permutations, it, it gets you closer to the the true. I say VIP. Yeah. Is it? Do, do other people say VIP? I, I have only ever thought VIP reading it. <laughs> and so I don't know. I, it's one of those that I don't know that I've ever actually heard it VIP. pronounced. Tony, okay, it's official, VIP. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, that's good to know. I might change my mental model. Um, you do you. Don't, don't let John <laughs> bully you into... Uh, VIP I'm not bullying. VIP. No, Tony, Tony's bullying. <laughs> Wait, are you a, a SQL or SQL person? SQL. It's, oh, I think that is the, the one where we draw the hard line. It is SQL... Uh, like the sequels. I'm yeah. just wondering if there's a correlation I, there. If you're it saying is. SQL, I, you're also VIP, and then SQL is also VIP. Yeah, Good well, because it's it's SQL. Well, it's yes. both, but it's more SQL for me. Mm. Okay, that explains a lot. Yeah, Tony, what what do you say? I think I say SQL. Yeah, yeah, there it is. That's the deciding factor. <laughs> I'm the one who decides. 
<laughs> so I vote goes to Tony. I think that's the the phrase. <laughs> Uh, one last one last function here for on, on the global data set level side for model profile. This is the, the PDP plot um, with the whole data set, whereas the, where are we at here? The Ceteris Paribus was the PB, uh, PDP for just a single point. This is the, partial dependence for the for the entire data set. And so again, we've got um, Russia age, I brought in position this time. It's it's kind of the average of the Ceteris Paribus profiles. So like for all of the, the data points in a data set, how does that kind of average out? Um, our, our usual problem of, of uh, highly correlated explanatory variables is still gonna show up. But I like this because um, you can kind of see how rush or age changes with position. And so um, I wonder if, you, you know, a few slides ago, we, we saw that there was this bump here at, at 25. So I kind of wonder if that was a, uh, um, an effect of just one of the positions. It looks like here wide receivers and quarterbacks have a little bit more pronounced than the running backs, which are, are pretty smooth decline. Um, I like this a lot because you can kind of add as many groups or variables, I think, as you want here. And I, I think that this is, this is also a very useful explanation to, to someone who, you know, might not explain, you know, might not understand what your model is doing. You need to kind of explain it to a, a business partner. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got on the global side. I've got one more chart to share if anybody has any questions. This is kind of a, again, from this, um, Dalek's GitHub page kind of breaks down what all of the different functions are, what chapters you can find them at in this exploratory model analysis books. I've also got references here for the Daleks and the Dalek Extra um, GitHub pages because they have these nice plots or these good examples of, of how to use it as well. But that was, that's all I've got for the presentation. I've got a few discussion questions to talk about, but if anyone wants to, to jump in. Maybe. Yeah. So, um, I, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, did have, sorry. Um, do you do you know? Did you like um, try anything out with doing approximate versus exact Shapley values? Um, I'm just kind of curious. Like, if there's like a noticeable difference, I can't remember what the the default for most packages is. Um, I think most of them do approximates. Um, like they'll they only take like a hundred observations by like some, mm -hmm. some number of observations by default. Mm. Uh, and instead of computing, I, I guess I, I think exact means they literally take every observation in the data set and do the whole Shapley calculation on every uh, on all the entire data set. You did not know that, so I, I don't know how it would change it. Let's see. I haven't looked this up myself. Yeah, I think this is the end option here in predict parts. Yeah. Where it looks like it takes 500. So I think that's your approximate Shapley yeah. values, right? I'm sure you could just set that up to uh, in your number of observations, get an exact Shapley value, right? I'm, I'm like just curious if anyone's actually like, uh, and I'm not even sure how you would do like a, a study on that. I guess you would have to like, you would have to specify just your given data set. Cause like, it's kind of hard to do it for like every type of data set. Um, and I don't know, my, my thought is probably just like with anything, all these kind of converge, right? Like central limit theorem, yeah. right? It, it, it converges to what the exact value is. So it's probably not worth doing. I wonder if you could use like the tweener package because that does a great job of interpolating values between points. And then mm -hmm. you could just fill in like all the points within and then just let it run for six years. And then it will <laughs> actually show like, hey, converge to this prediction. Um, yeah, here's, here's a good example of you know, what happens based on this random order. 
like you, these are all the same point where you end up with the same prediction, right? But you can see how different it, it is depending on, on what order it, it sampled them or, or I guess what how many samples it did. So I think that's this would be a good use case for increasing the number of of uh, values that it sampled. Um, also, you've talked about um, right, like interactions, um, like especially with the default method in Dalekshaw, uh, the non-Shapley method. I think I'm, I think it uses like permutation approach, mm -hmm. which in theory sounds really similar to Shapley, um, but I think the issue is like they don't test over every, they don't perturb every feature or something like that. They only do like your specified feature. I have to actually read the chapters to remember what the difference is. Um, but the issue with like doing the non shapley stuff is those those terms that are correlated, right? Like uh, sometimes the instance level prediction will like look weird or like, I don't know, it won't be like representative. And yeah. so in that case, it might be good to like explicitly model the interaction despite your model being like nonlinear, like tree-based. Um, just for the just for the interpretation, right? Like you'll actually capture and see that effect uh, in your instance-based permutation or like your your uh, feature informed plot. Um, I'm just curious if like that also do you also need to do that for Shapley, or is like since Shapley kind of considers all combinations of features, like maybe it kind of nullifies the need for doing that. Uh, that's, that's a good point. So I think to your first point, I think you can, I think what's cool about the, the DLX package or the DLX or package is that you can add features or take away features, right? And then make your explainer without them. I'm not, don't, don't quote me on that, but I, I think that you could probably model that interaction then feed it into this, this data thing. And I, mm, Maybe not, because I know that it, it takes in the model. So probably it's probably running the model here behind the scenes. So actually, I, I have to think more about how you would explicitly model an interaction and feed it into a breakdown plot like that. I mean, obviously, it's doing it with, with that specific command, but it, it takes a while. So I'm guessing it's just doing every permutation behind the scenes. Yeah, um, I guess I'm wondering, like, I'm wondering, do you have to go back and actually add that interaction term in your model, or like, can you leave it just to the Dalekshaw part where you don't have it explicitly in your, mo in your model, but then for plotting purposes, you add that interaction part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It, it must be, you know, Dalex is doing it somewhere for this, for this breakdown interactions thing. So I'd hope that you could do it after I wouldn't want to add it in my original model if I didn't have to, especially if it takes a while to train. <laughs> um, yeah, you had a good question about the, the Shapley values. I also, it's just intuition here. I'm not super familiar with this. I, I have a feeling that it would be less um, susceptible to to highly correlated variables, to interactive variables, because if it's using any type of, of, of game theory thing, then right, the, the variable should be cooperating in a sense. So I'm thinking it's, it's not quite an interaction term, but I'm guessing it, it, it looks you know, across which variable is the most important and then um, in relation to other variables. I Again, I'm, I'm kind of just shooting off the hip here, but I think it would make sense for for Shapley to be less susceptible than, than the breakdown plots by themselves. Yeah, I, you know, I need to read these chapters. I think I think both of us are kind of flying by the. Yeah. <laughs> the You're asking good questions. Not like, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I should have actually read this beforehand and been a little bit more prepared. But maybe I'll, is, I'll go and like look it up. This is an entirely different book. I mean, uh, you could almost read this entire book for for this one tidy models chapter <laughs> um 
Um, well, I'll, I'll make that my homework. <laughs> you guys can read, hold me read, accountable for it. Read an week. entire book before next week. Um, yeah, so I was, I was thinking about this and I, I'm mostly impressed with the you know, how many different ways you can go to interpret your model. And I think for a long time, I've, I've had to think about this, this trade-off between model interpretability and um, accuracy or, or uh, performance. And I have a feeling that like people on the machine learning side, uh, or at least me is my tendency. I want to err more towards accuracy than, than interpretability, but you know, in a business sense, there are lots of people who want you to focus on interpretability with these tools to understand models, you know, with things like, you know, cat boost, which are hard to explain to someone what, you know, what's the exact effect of this feature, you know, does it make sense to err towards performance if you can create plots like this to explain, maybe here's not the exact effect of this feature, but here's our best guess at the effect of a feature for a model that may be X more performant than, than an interpretable model. Yeah. yeah. I think like, um, I know at least the way that I direct people is like, you know, people clown on logistic regression, but it just teaches you better ways to like stir the data and make more meaningful features mm -hmm. as in like an interpretability exercise to get a feel for things. So yeah, like interpretability can be very powerful for like a business, you know, like most business partners are not like, wow, I know that there's like local minima here and that's the, <laughs> that's where the error is going, you know, like you're not going to be really explaining that, but like a logistic regression, you can explain, you know, and I think like some of the graphs that you had there, like the, um, it was like the, the grouping by like, position mm -hmm. right that graph that pdp plot it's yeah. amazing right like you can show that to a business partner and you can be like we'll see i can explain this to you and you know you can probably explain away like the little ridges because it's not a straight line or whatever yeah um but like you know that's why this package exists is to do that and you don't have to rely on like well they only use logistic regression for everything <laughs> yeah I like that example of, of stirring the pot with, with logistic regression. That was just the importance of uh, feature engineering. Yeah, because I think like what I've like gr grown with more is like, I think when I started out, I was like, ah, XG boost all day long. And then like, you know, you're given a problem to where like, hey, how do you implement an XG boost model into SQL? This was pre like, tidy predicts and everything else are you gonna like program every single one of those case when statements and then like you realize like well you know we'll just correct regression is pretty awesome uh if you know how to like corral the data correctly because then it's not like i mean it's it's cool to like throw everything in a pot and just be like eh, it's just gonna do some black magic I don't know if other people have had similar experiences, but I definitely have. It makes sense to me. I think this is, I, I love this package. I think it goes a long way to, to bridging that gap of interpretability for models that, uh, that weren't super interpretable in the past. Yeah, I would, and it, you, uh, you hit on this a little earlier, like, um, it helps like just identify like it's like you're debugging your model right like could be a data leakage issue or or whatnot like you see a feature is like much more weighted than you expect it to be and whether that's data leakage or not you have to maybe go back and figure out oh wait like there's some huge outliers in my data and they're creating this um so i don't know I, that's like an underrated aspect of it and uh yeah of course like um the explainability part right it like opens up the the gate ways so like breaks down the barriers in terms of like uh business applications where you're 
has to like explain every exactly why you got that how you got that prediction which yeah. you know is the big appeal of just uh, of a linear and logistic regression cool chapter thanks yeah thank you yeah i definitely learned a lot um i Something that I, I've been using this package for a few months, but it wasn't until I had to go read that book where I'm like, okay, now I'm starting to actually understand what the different fun like before you get a funny new package, you immediately try out all the functions. And I didn't really understand how they related to each other until I, I saw this, this pyramid. I'm like, okay, this is one side, this is the other side. Here's the mirror version. So definitely read the docs. <laughs> Good point yeah, I for wish that. I had learned about this package like last year. Yeah, right. Would have made things so a lot I, easier I, for me. I was using this last year, and they didn't have the tidy models wrapper yet. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know if there was all the extract parse temp fit stuff yet, like all those extra helper functions. And it was just like breaking my brain, like how to get it to work with Alex. And at, to the point where I just went back to like the base R package. If I was just doing like a, a Glimnet model, I'd have to, mm -hmm. yeah, I just go yep. use Glimnet directly. Oh, it's been working with Carrot forever. Like, yeah. that's how I like was introduced to it at least. So, and uh, Tony, you were you helped you jumped in one day on on a question I asked because I, I really love to see this work for a stacks model. I, I put it in a pull request or an issue. I haven't done the pull request yet, but I'm trying to figure out if it's something very big or something very small. <laughs> But I'm not sure exactly how it would even look for a stacks model, right? Is it going to take, is it going to take a stacks model in terms of your input variables, or is it going to take it in terms of the model outputs that you put in? So it's like I, I assume it would have to like work the same way that it works with like the base model you feed it, right? Doesn't it have to feed the score to like each one of the the stacked models and then do the the same amount of like interpolation or whatever? I mean, unless they run with just the end output, but it would, I guess yeah. you could make both, or I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it it could work with just basically treating the stack as the model mm -hmm. and ignoring right. the fact that it's a stack. So theoretically, yeah. it could just kind of work. Um, uh, yeah, what, what I'd love to see is, in terms of my initial input variables, like here's here's rush or age, here's position, because then you've made something that again is another step down the interpretability rabbit hole where you, now you've got a cat boost model that's stacked with a bunch of other weird models and it's it's even less interpretable, but you can get it back in terms of your initial data as opposed to a, a, a stacks model that just says, okay, well, here's the, here's the effect of, of a random forest model and here's how much your your logistic model impacted it because it, that's not super interpretable for, for, you know, for a business sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like, what are you looking for? Cause I guess that's the immediate answer, right? It's like you <laughs> say you had two models, like a, like a cat boost and random forest and you can create like, you know, instance level plots for each of those. And then maybe like, you know, your stack models, like, okay, 0. 0.6 to this one and 0. 0.4 to this one. Um, like, I don't know, what's the, I guess, what, what do you, I guess I'm not understanding like what you would be looking for in addition to that. Like, can you blend those to like instance level? Um, I think Dalex like, might be able to. I don't think I could personally, like if I had, right, if, if I had two feature important plots next to each other and, and if it's a stacks model, these might not be in the same order, right? Like maybe the, the second model is picking up on something totally different than the first model. And it, it, it weights this one 60% and this one 40%. If I go to, to somebody who's not a machine learning expert and I say, well, this is 60% and this is 40%, they're gonna ask me, okay, well, what's the most important variable? And I'm gonna tell them uh, probably this one because 6.6 .6 times this looks yeah. like it might be bigger than. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I get the I get the problem. I guess I'm. Like, I, I feel like it, you're going to end up, it, whatever it is, it's like, it's going to be an estimate of the reality, right? Or is there like an actual way to like go back and 
merge as two like instance level um, plots or values. Um, I don't know. I just maybe I, I'm not seeing no, it. Take, like, it's a good question. It. I I need to think more about it. I know that you can. I mean, you do have access to these these data sets. So I wonder if you could also mess with two Dalex objects and combine them in a similar way as your stacks model. Hmm. Huh. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I like the idea of being able to take an ensemble and still be able to say, well, what, what would we expect in this continuum of if this, you know, this other variable changed, um, you know, how would the model, how do we expect the model would change the, some of the other visualizations you had? So, um, yeah. <laughs> there are also some really cool things. If you're comparing two models here, I haven't, I haven't used this at all. It's, it's almost intimidating to me. I, I don't really know how to understand it, but this funnel plot is supposed to be for comparing two different models and so i think that um it would also be interesting to compare like here you know here's a stacks model here's how much it adds over you know one individual model or something yeah see this is about as much as i like say instead of comparing well yeah i guess technically with the stacks model with two models you're in some ways comparing terms but like i guess this is as much as i would expect out of uh an explainer for a, an, a, a stacks model. I just, I just don't know how you get to like a, like a singular plot um, like we have it, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just, <laughs> I'm just complaining for no reason. Maybe. No, no, I'm, I'm glad you're raising the point because maybe I need to adjust my expectations, but definitely something, or, or, you know, that I'm thinking about. So I'm glad that you asked. <laughs>